Welcome, Nicole. It's lovely to have you back here at Thomas, Texas. This is your second solo, and this exhibition is called Scraping By. Talk a little bit about Scraping By and why you've called all this work. Uh, scraping By, I'm glad you asked that actually, Anne. Scraping By came to me um, more as the name of a smaller work I did probably about a year ago uh, when I started to make some very tiny little um, baskets which reminded me of limpets. They sort of formed this beautiful limpet shape. So I did a little bit of research, went down that rabbit hole of limpets and found that limpets are responsible for scraping the intertidal zone clear of algae and other detritus to make it habitable for other creatures to thrive. And so they scrape the rocks and then come back to their home base and sit there until the tide goes of, comes in again and then off they go and, and do the same thing. And, and I saw the links between what the limpets were doing in terms of scraping clean the rocks and what I was doing in venturing out into my local streets and searching for raw materials, usually from council pickups, to use to create my limpet forms. So there was, it's not just making baskets from a, a, a secondhand materials or found objects, it's got another layer or narrative to it in, in terms of that link between what limpets do and their shape and form. A lot of research being done around limpets, so it just kind of kept exploding the whole concept of, of making limpets. And so it made sense eventually when I completed a larger body of work from my, I guess, scrapings from the road that I called it scraping by. And also, I guess I live quite sustainably and in lots of ways that is scraping by these days, like my cushions don't match and uh, everything I have is pretty much secondhand and I scrape by, I don't feel the need to live ostentatiously. So lots of reasons for choosing that name. I'm so delighted that you've made so many limpets for this exhibition because the last ones um, you made were on little rocks, which I proudly own, and they're just so beautiful, the connection of your basketry, which was very fine, on these lovely little pebbles. In speaking to these, it's quite nice, this little spot in the exhibition here, because there's one of the largest works here, and down the bottom here are some of the smaller limpets, which relate more to the ones you were referring to earlier, the small ones that would sit on a rock and are, are much more, well, even though they are still, you know, 10 centimetres across, they're cl getting closer to a real limpet size. But this one is more the limpet form, so it's, it's got bird wire in it and um, pieces of cane, deconstructed doormats. I'm looking at the other things that are in it at the moment. Um, there's orange bags, so there's big net bags you get your oranges in. I pull those apart and use them as single fibres to stitch with or to finger spin back together. So there's a lot of deconstruction of materials that then get reconstructed. The, <laughs> the white rope in this comes from Sydney Harbour, underneath the Q Station cliffs. Uh, so that's included in it. And there's also fabric. There's also um, doormats, things deconstructed that just are these beautiful fibres or beautiful colours or textures that I can't let go to waste. They're headed for landfill and so they come to this and it's a product of that. There's no set plan but I do put together the materials and look at how they're going to work together and colour obviously impacts. I love those oranges and natural colours and the darker pieces that those limpets that you probably remember from childhood that lit to the beach or you tried to lever off in the rock pools when you were wading around and mucking around in rock pools, you know, getting the sea urchins, not sea urchins, the sea anemones to 
clamp in and you try and lever off the, the limpets to see what they were doing underneath. Um, so those colours are very inspiring and, and if you look through the exhibition you'll see that I've used a lot of those natural tones with the bleached uh, yellowy sort of straw colours and the orange colours that you see on some of them. Yeah, I, I used to collect them when I was a kid, these limpets. I had jars of them and you know, you pick them up off, up, up off the beach and some had worn through at the top so you thread them on all your fingers like rings and you know, princess limpet. So there's a long history of association and when you're young you don't even notice but you come back to it at, at this age, I won't tell you how old I am, but old. And you just go, hey, I've always had this relationship going on with these things and now suddenly they're providing the inspiration for what I'm doing. It's, it's really interesting. Well, for me, for me, that sort of revisit and how life becomes quite circular. There, there are other things, you know, that I've used in this exhibition that, that harken back to earlier times in either works that I've done or, or childhood. Yeah, I've always collected things. Okay. Nicole, these um, leaves that you've created, people have loved. They've come through and they've commented, most people um, have just been captivated by these leaves. They're big and they're bold and the shadows are lovely. Do you, mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit to these? Um, yeah, sure. These, um, these almost created themselves. They, they're backbone that you see in each of them, that it's wood washed up on my local beach, um, usually after storms, I'll come back with the armfuls. And um, I think that most of them come from Norfolk Pines that have had the bark stri stripped off in the tumbling in the ocean. And I just love the shapes. So those shapes are there already for me to start with, and that is the starting point. And the, the outside wire, um, comes from old hills hoists. Again, you'll find them at the side of the road, often with a big cement clump at the bottom and the rest of the hills hoist in various sort of I don't know, pieces. And, <laughs> and the wire, and there's only two ways you find hills hoist wire. One is in this, someone's obviously chopped it up neatly and put it in lovely coils ready for me, or in big messy tangles because they've just ripped it apart and shoved it with the hills hoist to throw out. But it actually forms really nice shapes. You unstrand it and you just get these beautiful organic shapes from that. So that really works and that makes up a lot of the structure. And then the rest of the leaf are old washes that are thrown out when Grandpa or the old man down the street passes away and they just put his shed out on the nature strip and while most people want to buy it and go oh look at all that filthy stuff I'm the one there going through it all and grabbing washers and old tools anything rusty and um, I, I carry around screwdrivers and hammers and saws and things in my car all the time so I can you know access these things and have containers to put them in so it it's a full-time job this making things from collected uh, rubbish. These leaves, then I, I looked at the leaves, I have beautiful swamp mahoganies around my house which discard a lot of blossom and a lot of leaves and they have these beautiful sort of lines in them and colours and little sort of flaws and I've just tried to capture that with, with these and close up you can see, I'm not sure how close up you can get with the, the camera but there are small pieces which just give a nod to the textile artist in me. So there are small little basketry, I don't know what they're called, the little floors in leaves, nodules or um, dots from where insects have burrowed in or the hailstones hit the leaf, whatever. So I love creating things that are not perfect. I love letting the materials speak for themselves and the imperfections are quite beautiful. You're so well known for your basketry. Would you like to talk about some of the baskets and the little technique because they're very unique style for you? Um, sure, sure. Um, 
I collect things that can go into textile works and I like that assembling, that creating from nothing. Basketry I discovered many, many years ago and I sort of went on the back shelf of my world and then one day suddenly it's like a light bulb went on and I had a whole lot of shopping bags. The Jampy Weavers were starting to become quite well known and I went, hey, I could use these old plastic shopping bags as fibre to make baskets. And so I made one um, and it was dreadful, but I've improved since then. And I also looked at um, no longer collecting materials like plastic blue shopping bags, which eventually deteriorate and don't have the integrity that you need. But I now look at things like trampoline mats, orange bags, fruit mats, just having a look to see what else has been used in these. Um, cords from, from clothing. There's a packing house out west that saves me all their baling twine that goes around their hay stacks, hay, not hay stacks, some hay bales. Um, and again, people leave things for me. So if someone has old rope, it ends up on my front deck when I get home. So the collection is very much what drives this basket making. And I use a traditional technique, which the stitch basket tree, which lots of cultures across the world use. And they all utilize what's available naturally in their environment. So I guess if I lived in the jungle, I'd be using lawyer vine. If I lived out in the desert, I'd be using spinifex. But I live in an urban environment, quite close to the beach. And so I use rubbish. There's a lot of it there and there's it's just endless, as we all know. Textile waste is sort of second or third only to food and building waste or building construction waste. So, so there's a piece um, here that has an old oil can or a drum for the base, and then it's worked up with rope and baling twine, and then it's got trampoline fixtures around it. Comes up a bit further to the old pool filter from my, my sister's pool. Um, and then at the top is a garden wire basket that's ended up being squashed and thrown out, but I've gone, hey, that looks great how that's squashed, and so it's now become part of the basket and the form. There's a, a large piece here that's made from the base of an old hot water heater and corrugated iron and copper pipe from when I had my bathroom redone. So there's a lot of things that are thrown away and then I just can see those possibilities, I put them back together in a different way and suddenly it's an art piece, not something belonging in landfill. I don't think it suddenly it becomes an art piece. I think you've got a very fine eye at looking at something and then seeing it as a very high-end artwork. And so there's all that level of artistry that you bring to your collecting and deconstructing in terms of creating artwork. Yeah, yeah. I guess because I don't overthink it. It, it seems, it, I, I don't want to say it comes, it comes easily, but I actually can see what something can become. And I can see the qualities that then can be developed or highlighted or what will go with it to then create something that's um, aesthetic. And I don't know, I, I just make things that bring me joy. Mm -hmm. So if I get pleasure from something, that's almost enough. And it, it's, it's wonderful when other people get pleasure from it too. There's a lot of pleasure on these walls. They're very joyful and colorful and they certainly work. Is there an area that you're going to lean into next? Have you found another link um, subject that you're just looking at sideways and thinking I'd like to explore that? Um, yeah, I'd actually like to work on incorporating more texture into my works if that's possible. So maybe stitching and incorporating more timber and more wire, more, like more. So I think I'm just scratching the surface 
in terms of the combinations of metal, wire, textiles, wood. I think there's a lot further to go with that in putting that together. Um, and it's exciting. The leaves are certainly one of my newer directions and I'd like to look at making them into outdoor assemblages. I do a lot of outdoor installations and sculpture as well as, as things that sit inside. The yep. planet's certainly a much healthier place with you in it, with all the reusing of rubbish that would end up in landfill or in our oceans and our waterways. And so, on behalf of the planet, I'd like to thank you. That's a big call, isn't it? Well, I, I, I'm not kidding myself, but I'm making a big difference to landfill. I think, you know, the success of my work is changing somebody else's outlook, not just me making something from something recycled. It's somebody else coming here or seeing my work somewhere and then going, oh, I hadn't really considered that. Oh, maybe I'll try that. Or maybe I'll um, not throw that away. Or maybe I'll give that to some... There are other ways to look at what we're throwing away. So that's the success of my work to me. If somebody changes how they look, at something that they would have thrown away. Mm. It's a wonderful way of raising awareness of what we do need to do. Sure. So thank you for that. Thank you. No, thank you, and you're the one who's, you know, given me this opportunity and is hosting uh, uh, the works. So they actually are presented uh, in a way that people will notice and and maybe take away that message. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thanks. It's such a pleasure to have you here again. Oh, thank you. I love this gallery. Its exhibition coincides with a, the first exhibition I opened, which was 12 years ago. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I hope there's a cake. <laughs>